today we're talking about real estate, all things real estate. A big part of our mission is building a legacy through real estate. Cool? Introductions. We're going to tell you a little bit about who we are. I am Michelle Morton. I'm a licensed realtor, DC, Maryland, Virginia. Um, I have partner agents and a team of agents all over the country. So do not feel like because you're in the DMV, we cannot serve you. And more than that, even if you decide not to work with us, don't feel like you can't get a lot of quality information from this session today. So a little bit more about me. I'm a wife and a mommy of three. That's my why. Those are the three reasons why I'm in this business, right? Because it's more than just buying and selling houses. It's really about building a legacy. So my goal is to help people buy, sell, and invest in real estate. Awesome. Mr. Duncan, you want to tell us about Team Evolve? Yes. Hi, my name is Andre Duncan. I'm the market manager for Evolve Bank. Uh, we are licensed and we lend in all 50 states. So we cover the entire country. Um, on my team, um, Jordan Lundy is our primary loan officer who, who works and assists um, me with working with our clients. Lexi, we have an in-house credit department. Uh, I know some of you responded about credit and getting pre-qualified. Lexi is the person whose dedicated job is to collect, review documents. Unlike a lot of companies, we do not just pull your credit and say, oh, you don't meet the score and we send you off. Um, we have an in-house credit repair. We do analysis. We have what-if tools that tell you that if you pay this, do this, by this time, you'll be ready. Um, which is a really, really, really strong tool. Um, what makes us a little different than a lot of lenders, um, and we, and the reason we like working with Michelle, we, we feel that it's important to educate you, make sure you fully understand the process. Uh, it's not about just how quickly can we get you approved to buy a house. We want you to be fully educated because you're going to buy multiple houses in your lifetime. So our job is to make sure you fully understand it. Um, we offer down payment programs, so don't, don't feel like you can't buy a house. If you don't have money, we deal with all gamuts of credit and all types of buyers. Um, that's just who we are. And we take a lot of pride on how we communicate and work with our clients. <laughs> Absolutely. And I know a lot of people will ask, well, why would I work with, um any particular bank, right? Or any particular lender. And it's the same way with any particular realtor, right? It's really about who you work with the best, who you gel with the best. And for me, my goal, that's why we call it the squad is because we really like to be a team. 90 plus percent of my business is worked with me as a realtor and Andre and team evolve as the lending team because we ebb and flow and we know how we work. And from start to finish from, you know, there's people in the comments saying they've been working on credit some of our clients, what, Andre, a year, maybe two, and, yeah. you know, yeah. until they're ready. Um, and our job, starting with Lexi, is to nurture them and get them prepared. And then they move on to Jordan and then Andre and then myself when it's time to actually purchase the hat. So full service, white glove service. Awesome. Our promise. So our promise. So this business is more, again, than just helping you buy and sell a house, right? It's more than just transactional. It's more than just um, a check, right? This is my mission. This is my ministry. And again, the reason why Andre and myself, we work so well together and my entire team is because we believe that mission the same, right? So when Andre said, you're going to buy more than one house throughout your lifetime, obviously, well, honestly, hopefully that the purpose is not only to just buy that house throughout your lifetime, but to pass that to your children and your children's children and your children's children. Most of my clients, when I ask them, why do you want to, usually the first question I ask is, why do you want to buy a house? And when they say, I want something better for my children, or, you know, I never owned a house, or I'm the first person in my family to own a house. And that right there is what really drives us and pushes us. What would you say, Andre? What, do you, what would you say your, your mission and your ministry is? Well, we just, you know, I, I think mine is goes back to my childhood, quite honestly. I'm, I was the first one in my family to own a house. And, and I feel there's a strong drive for me to help so many other people break that for their families. Um, so that I, cause I want my kids to buy and their kids to buy. 
And the other part is our team is so full of diversity. Um, we, we, we pride ourselves on, we're here to help. We want everyone to grow. Um, it's, it's, and then one of my favorite sayings is, why not you? You know, it's one of the things I say to my kids all the time is, why not me? Um, and I think if you have that mindset that um, anything's possible. A lot of people are going to make you think you can't buy a house. Our job is to show you how you can buy one. Love, love, love. Again, this is why I love Team Evolve. <laughs> yeah. And so Marie says that her purpose for wanting to buy houses to leave a legacy for her children. And she is the first homeowner in her family. So you guys drop in the chat. Let us know why are you here besides just getting information. But what's the big why? Right. Why do you want to buy your first, second or third house? And, you know, to to share, like to add on to Andre's story. So even my aunt, she's here. Um, Vanessa Heatley, I always call her out. She's going to kill me. <laughs> but she's on um, this chat and she has owned many homes and she invests in real estate, but she still joins us because this is about, you know, taking the information, sharing it with her church, sharing it with her family, and even maybe picking up a few nuggets for the next chapter in, you know, her purchasing by helping people buy, sell, and invest in real estate. Awesome. And you guys don't be shy. Drop something in the chat. All right. So what are we going to talk about today? So let's see. Single mom, Heather says she's a single mom, age 40. Sorry, Heather, I don't know if I was supposed to say that. <laughs> I have never owned a home. I have, oh, hey, Heather, see, I love this. I have always um, hoped, hop from apartment to apartment. I am ready for something to be my own. I want to entertain my friends, have cookouts and parties. I'm the realtor that's going to show up at the cookout. So make sure <laughs> you invite me to the cookout. Yay. Um, and Marie says, hopefully to, to get in some investment properties. Absolutely. Just funny. <laughs> she says her food is seasoned, y'all. <laughs> awesome. All right, guys. So what are we going to talk about? We already kind of dove down the lane a little bit, right? Why do we want to own a home, right? Then we're going to talk about why well, most of us are here, the money, right? The money, the financing. Then we're going to talk about the process from start to finish and a little bit of how we can define your roadmap. Cool. Uh, Marquita says wanting to set a foundation young. I love that, right? It's just like the stock market. It compounds over time, right? Um, and I want to also let you know, so when you guys send something in the chat, make sure the drop down is replied to everyone. If you have a private note that you are a private question that's specific to like your credit or something like that, pull that drop down to um, ask the moderators only, and then we will pull, we will respond, we will ask those questions without calling your your name out. Awesome. So we kind of did this a little bit. Andre, do you want to tell a little bit more about yourself? Um, yeah, I mean, I'll share a little bit. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, my background is I have a bachelor's degree in computer science. My master's degree is in technology. Um, and you would say, how in the heck did that turn into to mortgages and banking? Uh, probably about 15 years ago, I decided to get into mortgages and banking. Um, part of that was because I felt like there was an opportunity to take my expertise with process and improvements and just making things simplistic. And we built a whole team around how to take a very complicated process and how to break it up so that it works and it flows and it becomes repetitive and it has a high success rate. Um, and again, we, we have by default, not that we don't do all kinds of loans and mortgages, a lot of what we do tends to be first time home buyers. We have the parts of my team and my group that only deals with second and third and only deals with investors. Um, but I have a little soft spot for the underdogs. Um, so that, that tends to be uh, who we tend to gravitate to the most. Um, we, as I said before, we are, we are a bank. We lend in all 50 states. So this is not a situation where if you get pre-approved or we tell you you can buy, you got to say, oh, I got to deal with someone differently. We're located, like I said, I'm physically in Delaware. We have offices all over the East Coast, but Evolve has offices all over the country. You still would be working with us. We would be able to lend. Um, that's the big piece. And like I said, we have a lot of programs because we are a bank. 
whereas we don't have a lot of overlays and special rules that some other mortgage companies may have. Absolutely. How many of you guys are first time home buyers? How many of you are, you know, buying your second home or even your retirement home? Like, where are you in the process? Why owning a home is right for you? Hmm. What do you think, Andre? Well, I, I, my, my big reason for why you should own a home, and someone mentioned this earlier in one of their chats, my, one of my favorite analogies is think about how many times you've written rent or every time you pay that, pay that rent payment or you move to a different place and you have to add something to the house or fix something to an apartment. Well, why is owning right for you? Because it's your home. This will be your home. Uh, you're making improvements and investing into yourself. Um, and, and I know that may sound a little cliche, but I'm just sharing with you that owning a home positions you to have wealth. And if you're younger or even older, the my biggest thing is this is the best way to save money. And you say, how is owning a house saving money? Because owning a house is going to grow in value and what you owe is going to go down. That what's in the middle, that's your money. That's, that's money that you're paying yourself. You're paying back to yourself. Whereas you stay in an apartment for three years and you move out. No one is going to say you own anything. No one's going to say, oh, here's all the money that you paid in. And oh, well, you know what? The, the apartment's worth more. Where the house will be worth more and you owe less. And that's your equity. That's, that's building wealth. So I, I just think right now, owning, owning a house and investing in a house is the best way to have a savings account. Especially if you're in the younger part of this call, there is no guarantee that social security, most people don't have pensions. You know, a lot of, it used to be your parents or your grandparents work somewhere for 30 years and they got a pension. You could work some places now for 30 years and still not get a pension. So you, you're gonna have to be finding ways that are in your norm. What are better, you always gotta have somewhere to live. Why not let that be your investment plan for your retirement? Absolutely. And I think the good thing is a lot of you are here because you already know why you wanna own a home, right? We've had, and we have a lot of first time home buyers, Andre, which is awesome. Um, and so I know for, I love what, um, I think it was Heather or someone else that, the cookouts, the parties. I'm a dinner party girl myself. So just being able to have a place where your family can always come, right? So there's the financial aspect of why you should own instead of rent. But then there's also like the heart aspect, right? You want a place for your children to grow up. You want a backyard so that they can run and play. You want to not have to ask the landlord to come in to, for permission to do things. Like there's so many reasons why we want to own. Awesome. So now we're going to talk a little bit about some of um, now we're going to get into the money people. So we're going to talk a little bit about down payment assistance programs, the difference between loan programs and all of that good stuff. Yeah, the, the, well, I'm going to jump right to the, the some of the products, and especially because so many people are specific to first time home buyers. I, I will cover some of the other products, but I want to make sure that I really highlight to you that we have down payment programs from everything from a 620 credit score up to an 800 credit score. Um, and with, when we say down payment programs, what's nice about our programs is, is even if you make too much money, because some people say, well, I can't get a down payment program, I make too much money, or I don't make enough money. Um, we have a program that will fit for everyone. Um, so what that means is you could technically buy a house without a down payment. That's different, that's different than the closing cost, but you definitely will be eligible to be able to get uh, down payment assistance. So I always say the number one reason people say they can't buy a house is because they don't have the down payment money. And I always say, well, that's off the table because we're going to take care of the down payment. So that's not a reason. If that's always been your reason is I got to save up for a down payment, I can tell you we'll be able to take that off the table for you. That will not be an issue. You will be qualified. Even if you've owned a house before, 
you can still get the down payment assistance. So I, I just want you, if you don't hear anything else, I want you to take off the table that I can't buy because I don't have down payment money. That's not the case. The next big piece that most people run into is closing costs. Um, and in this market right now, it's very competitive and it's really tough. By, by law, by guideline, the seller can pay your closing costs. Most of them right now are choosing not to do it because the market is so good. But just so that you know, the seller can help you with your closing costs. And that's where an agent comes in to help you with that negotiations. There are grant programs. There's other programs to help you. I am a proponent of you being able to save up some money. My, my, my piece is even when you look to buy an apartment or move to a new apartment, you usually got to come up with the first month and the last month for deposit. So you're, so again, you can come up with money, but the concept that you got to have 15, 20, $30,000 to, before you can buy a house is not true. I know there's a lot of people who still believe I can't buy a house unless I can put down 20%. That's not the case. With the process that we use and we call it the Evolve Express, where you apply, we will literally go through your credit. We'll figure out which programs you're available for, which ones you're qualified for, what do we have to do to get you ready for them. All of that is without a charge. So I, I always say there is nothing lost by getting more information specific to your situation. Um, of being able to do it. We do investments, we do all of those products. Um, so for as low as the lowest down payment you can do is three and a half percent. Let's say you said, I don't wanna use a down payment program. I got my own money. Um, the least amount you can put down is three and a half percent and you can put down as much as you would like. I'm not a big proponent of using your own money and, take, and being house poor because when you buy a house, there are going to be expenses you're going to have. So we want to make sure that when you buy the house, that we're putting you in a position to enjoy your house. We don't want you to move in your house and have no money because not, then you're going to resent the house. You're going to be mad at the house. You're going to be like, I used to be able to, you're not even going to be able to invite friends over because you don't have any money. Um, so we really try to work with you to come up with what is a realistic plan. When we prequal you, we're going to tell you what the system says your max amount is, but you, we're going to try to get you to figure out what's your max that you're comfortable with. Um, so again, we, we really work to navigate you through the process, but it is educational throughout. Awesome. Andre, quick question. So I think the inquiring minds want to know, what are the requirements for this down payment assistance program? The minimum score is a 620. So you have to have at least a 620 credit score. Obviously, to not just for the down payment program, we're going to make sure you have a job, <laughs> you got <laughs> income, those, those components. There are debt to income requirements um, that vary for each different program. That's why one of the first things we do is we have you do a mini app. We collect your income docs and we will put you in the right down payment program. But trust when I tell you, we don't have, there's no one that wouldn't be eligible for one of the programs. There is a program for the lower scores, the higher scores, uh, all those different pieces. Perfect. And guys, what I usually say is, what I usually tell clients is um, a couple things, right? So one, I always say that there are many down payment assistance programs. A lot of times we call with just a couple in mind, right? There are federal programs, there are state programs, there are county programs, there are private programs. There are so many down payment assistance programs. As consumers, as buyers, we do not have to go out and find those on our own, right? If we partner with, if we apply with a Bank of America or a Navy Federal, then we may have to find those programs on our own. But usually when you work with an Evolve or a, um, a lender that's a little bit more involved in the process, all we do is apply and they tell us which programs are best for us. Is that accurate, Andre? Correct, correct. Yeah, that's why I said you don't need to worry about that part of it. <laughs> 
we, we handle that for you. Now, I saw someone ask the question uh, about credit karma or the credit score you see on your credit rep or on your credit cards. I can just tell you that they are not the same scoring model as a mortgage credit. My, my example is if you've ever, if you get credit, if you go buy a car, they use, car dealerships use a specific scoring model. If you go get a credit card, they use a certain scoring model. Mortgage companies and banks use a scoring model. Your score could vary from all three of those. Systems like Credit Karma and some of these other ones, they do a blend of all of them to give you a credit score. Whereas a mortgage credit is totally different than some of the others. Um, there's some parts that make a mortgage credit better because a mortgage credit looks to see how you paid your bills over a long period of time. Whereas credit cards tend to more care about um, how have you done recently? That's why it's harder to get a credit card typically than anything else because they wanna know how well you're paying in the short side. A mortgage wants to look at, because you're gonna have a mortgage for 30 years. So they're looking at your past history to judge how, so you could do a mortgage credit and be like, I had a real bad rough spot a year ago, two years ago. And a mortgage credit may actually give you a little better score than a credit card will. So that's, that's how that works. Someone asked a question, I saw that pop up. Mm -hmm. If you go direct to Experian and you get a direct Experian credit score, that will tend to match the same score I'll get for Experian because that's a raw score. But going through it through a you know credit card, credit karma, some of the things I'm not beating up on credit karma, but I don't like credit karma. Their main job is to keep you paying that monthly bill. That's, that's what their job is. They want to keep you, some months they're going to take you up, some months they're going to take you down. They have a vested interest in keeping you in for the long haul. My job and the credit we're looking to do is we want to help you position you. We're going to not just tell you to dispute items, get rid of items. We really want to position you for credit long term. Again, back to my point of I don't want to just take... I know there are some companies that will just tell you, dispute this, do this, do this. Your score shoots way up. Well, when you apply for a mortgage, they're going to make you take those things off. That's why I'm a big advocate of saying if you're working with a credit repair company and you're applying for a mortgage, stop working with the credit repair company. If you got the right lender or the right partner, they will navigate you through what you should pay and not. Absolutely. And so, and from a mortgage standpoint for um, Team Evolve and for Andre, his response is always going to be, if you want to know what your credit score is and how you stack up when it's time to apply for a mortgage, submit the application. Why? Because they can pull the credit themselves. Um, from my perspective, most likely I'm going to do the same. I'm going to say, speak to Andre, but I know a lot of us are in programs or we're working on our credit. I would say, and Andre, please chime in. I would say the probably the most accurate um, tool would be my FICO. Yeah. If I was going to recommend one, that would be <laughs> the one. If I was going to recommend one, that I would say that's going to give you the only piece I say with those is what we're going to add on top of that for no cost. We're going to tell you exactly what to pay. Let's say you got a credit card that has a five hundred dollar balance. We have a tool that will say, if you pay $200 on that card, your score will go up to eight points, 10 points, 15 points. We're, and you want it that way. So again, all of those other tools may work, but the only thing is we're gonna help navigate you through how to get the best score for your mortgage. Absolutely, and sometimes we, we get so scared that we don't move, right? So usually when my clients, especially like if a client comes to me and um, we're at like a 500, there may be some work that we need to do before going to Andre and team. But if we're at like a 580-ish moving and shaking and doing all the right things, I'm probably going to say, let's get in touch with Team Evolve, let them run it. So that way they can tell us what we need to do to get that needle moving. Cool. And it costs nothing. Um, question, is 620 median score or score in general? Medium score. 
a mortgage credit pulls all three bureaus and we take the middle score. That's all mortgages, not just Evolve. We will pull all three credit bureaus and whatever your mid score is, that's the score we use. Yeah, that's, I mean, it's, it's, I'm sorry, Andre. No, I just wanted to say, that's one of the things where people get upset sometimes. They'll say, I pull my Experian and my Experian was 680. And I'll go, yeah, Experian is 680, but your other two were 540, 530. We have to use the 540 in that example. Now, what we're going to figure out is why does Experian have it 140 points? Again, this is where our expertise can help you. If one of your scores is way higher than the other, obviously something is reported or maybe something was paid off on one, the one that you were monitoring, but it didn't get updated on the other two. That's some of the things that we can help figure out for you. Awesome. And guys, mid score, it's super literal, right? It's not like the average. It's if one's a 600 and one's a 620 and one's a 640, it's literally the 620. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Correct. So it's super literal. It's literally the score that's in the middle. So um, a lot of times I, I get questions about that too. Andre, can you explain to us the difference between the different loan programs like FHA, VA, USDA? Yes. Yep. No Conventional. problem. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Let's start with the, the easier of the two. A VA, a VA loan is a mortgage that is available to veterans. You have to be a veteran or your spouse could be a veteran, but Someone on that mortgage has to be a veteran. And with a VA loan, there is no down payment. That's, that's what, it, that's to me, to, I always say, that's the easiest one to explain. The next one that's just as good is a USDA loan. A USDA loan is a loan that is available to people who live in a rural area. Um, let me find my military hobby. I see. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so a USDA loan says there is no down payment required on that, but the requirement that typically makes USDA loans not available to everyone is the property has to be located in an area that USDA deems rural. Um, and it doesn't always mean out in the middle of nowhere. It just has to be, it could be in a town that's considered rural. And the other part with USDA, the guidelines are a lot tighter meaning the amount of debt to income, the amount of bills compared to your income is tighter. Both of those loan programs require no down payment, VA, USDA. So in either one of those, you wouldn't need a down payment program because there is no down payment required. The next program is the FHA, which is typically, I don't want to say always, but that's typically the program that a majority of buyers use for their first homes. So we have people doing it even for their second homes. Um, the, the, the part is it requires the lower down payment. It tends to require, I'm gonna say tends, um, to be more forgiven for lower credit scores. Um, and I'm just moving them in that order. But FHA tends to be the most broadest program out there. A lot of the down payment programs, a lot of the assistant programs, a lot of the grants, they're all available with FHA loans. Some of them are available for conventional, but, but almost all of them are available when you use an FHA loan. The minimum down payment on an FHA loan is three and a half percent. That's the least amount you can put down on an FHA loan. The next one is conventional. And conventional is what I would say, and again, and I don't, I don't, I don't want to say it this way, but conventional tends to be the loan that when someone is going to put down 20% or a bigger down payment, because you can get lower mortgage insurance. These other programs have mortgage insurance. Conventional will have mortgage insurance as well if you don't put down 20%, but it tends to be the more money you put down the higher your credit score, the lower the mortgage insurance. On an FHA loan, no matter what your credit score is, the mortgage insurance is the mortgage insurance. So if you got a 780 credit score and a 620 credit score on an FHA loan, your mortgage insurance is going to be the same. When you do a conventional loan, 
your rate, your mortgage insurance, all of that is going to be a variable of your credit score and your down payment. That's, that's how those work. That's really the main mortgage programs that are available. Now, there's lots of options within each one of those, but those really are the main categories of programs. Perfect. Is FHA credit score a 620 as well? Great question. <laughs> Great question. Let me tell you what. <laughs> it's a loaded question. F FHA will advertise that their minimum score is a 560. You're not going to find a lender out there that will lend to a 560. You may find someone who might do a 580, but ever since COVID hit, pretty much everyone stopped and everyone went to a 620. So for the most part, and I'm not going to say there may not be some one off, but pretty much everybody now is at a 620 minimum. You may call, if you call a credit union, they may tell you the minimum score for an FHA loan or any loan is 680. This is when you hear people talk about overlays. Every FHA says, we'll go down to a 560, 580. Every lender gets to decide what is their minimum score. And that's why I say our minimum score is 620. You may tomorrow run into or pick up an ad or see an article and they say minimum score is 680. It's not that what I said is wrong or what they're saying is wrong. Each lender has their own minimum credit score requirement. Absolutely. And guys, from my perspective, what I would say is that 100% um, agree with Andre, right? A lot of the times we'll advertise, like, you know, you can get approved for FHA with 580, which is true, right? But depending on your debt to income ratio, depending on how much money you have saved in the bank, all of those variables collectively determine like how much house we can buy, how much our interest rate is going to be. And my job, Andre's job, our team's job is to get you into the best financial situation. The worst nightmare for us would be two years from now, you have to sell the house or get out of the house for any reason, right? So a lot of the times when we tell you things that um, they're a little bit different than the clickbait that's out there, that's why, because we truly have your best interest at heart. Awesome. I hear a lot of sellers prefer, prefer a conventional loan buyer over FHA, mostly. That's another loaded question, <laughs> right? And so it's, it's twofold, right? So there's a couple of reasons. So one, um, some communities are just not FHA approved and that is not a ding on the FHA program, right? A lot of communities, especially a lot of condo communities or townhome communities that have really high um, condo rates, they end up being delinquent. So people aren't paying their HLA dues. A delinquent community will not be FHA approved. Correct, Andre? Correct. Awesome. So that's one issue, right? Um, the second part of that question would be that when we go out and look at houses, right? Right now, of course, properties are getting five, 10, 20 plus offers. <laughs> and the seller has to decide which one is the best. Um, a good offer is a good offer, no matter how it's being financed. Conventional, sometimes people think there's a stigma that sellers think that their um, conventional is a stronger buyer. Absolutely not true. The one thing that um, if someone takes a crazy offer, house is worth 300,000, right? That's what it's listed on the market for. People start bidding it up. Now all of a sudden that people are, someone says, I'm gonna pay $360,000 for the house. We'll talk about this a little bit later, but the house has to appraise for 360 in order for the bank to pay 360, right? Or a percentage of that 360. Well, what's happening now is people are saying, um, so let's say the appraisal comes back low, right? Let's say the appraisal comes in, Mr. Appraiser says this house is only worth 340. Well, with an FHA mortgage, that appraisal follows the house. So if someone is trying to like get way more for the house than they think it's worth, then sometimes they won't accept FHA because they think that, that a low appraisal will follow the house. So that's kind of technical, but does that make sense? You guys drop in the chat and let me know if that makes sense. What would you say, Andre? What would, from your perspective, what would you say about FHA versus conventional? I, I, I believe the bigger issue is there's a stereotype yeah. on those two programs. Yeah. For the longest time, if someone was doing conventional, typically the, you had a higher credit score, mm -hmm. you were putting down more money because conventional underwriting just doesn't allow for 
conventional is a tougher loan to get an approval on. So what it is, is a lot of people have the perception that if you're doing FHA, you must be doing it because you can't do conventional. That's the perception. Yeah. And what is no longer the case anymore is this whole concept that you have to put down a lot of money or you're not a good borrower. People now are getting smarter about their money, which flies in the eyes of conventional versus FHA. But it's really more of a perception, especially depending on who's selling the house or who the agent is. Because a lot of times agents have a perception that conventional buyers are better than an FHA buyer. And I always say, you got to look at the, the offers on their merit. Whichever is the better offer, you shouldn't let the finance and dictate it because there's times we change finance and halfway through the process. And we don't have to go tell anybody that we went from conventional to FHA, FHA to conventional. Doesn't mean you're not a bad, no one should take that personal. It's just someone's perception on the other side. And honestly, it, it comes down to the realtor, right? Because my sellers don't think FHA or conventional is worse, right? If I tell them that FHA is worse, then that's where that perception comes from, right? Um, but talk to your realtor. A good realtor is going to know how to navigate. Um, I also say that if you're already in the market and you're already looking at houses and your realtor is out there working hard for you and he or she has lost a couple of deals, that's just the name of the game right now, right? Where a year ago you put in one offer, you get a 3% seller concession. Now it just may take a little bit longer. A year ago, I told every client that if we're serious about buying a house, once we're pre-approved and not just window shopping, within two weeks, we should be under contract. Now that's usually, that's more like six, six to eight weeks, six to nine weeks, depending on, um, just depending on the house in the market and how competitive. Cool? Awesome. Let's see, with being pre-approved for FHA loan and a mid-score of 639, what are some grant programs to assist with down payment? 639 yeah. credit score. Yeah, we, we, we have, 639 is probably, has probably, there's no issue as 639. We have two programs that are available at that credit score to cover the full down payment. The whole, the whole down payment would be covered. Even at a 620, we would cover the full down payment. Where, where the issue comes at a 639, you would not be able to buy as much house as someone with a 660 credit score, if, if that makes sense. You still could get the down payment. What the, what the program does is it says, we're just gonna make sure that your debt to income ratio is lower. So whereas if your score was 660, we may be able to approve you for $400,000 house. At a 639, we may be approving you at a $400,000 house. The point is that's where the score plays. Not that you can't get the down payment program, the restriction may be on how much house you can buy. Awesome. And so guys, well, how I explain it a lot of times when I'm, I'm from a realtor's perspective um, to my clients is there's three major things that our lenders are going to look at, right? They're going to look at credit, they're going to look at income, and they're going to look at assets. Credit, generally anything, again, right now over 620 is really where we want to start taking some action, we can start getting some money <laughs> to help us with the down payment, anything over 640 gets us more money. Accurate, Andre? Correct. Perfect. And so when Andre talks about debt to income ratio, a lot of us understand it. We've already been um, going through this process. But what that means is that bank looks at our income. They look at our monthly expenses. Expenses include things that are on the credit report, credit cards, auto loans, student loans, any other type of installment loan. That's what they're looking at, the monthly payments. That ratio usually needs to be, what, 45 through? That's, that's where it varies. This is, <laughs> this, this is where it really gets down to which program, which down payment program to, to Michelle's comment. You know, if you're in a conventional loan, you can't go higher than a 45 to 47. You maybe hit 50, but you're really in that 45 to 50 range for debt to income. FHA at a credit score higher than 660, you can go up to a 57. DTI, which means you can buy, you can have, you can have a higher mortgage. That's that's where the income matters, the credit score matters, 
those are the variables why we always say the first thing you got to do is do your pre is to get prequal so we can figure out because there's no way you're going to know these things without letting the lender do, do the work first. And that's what I was going to say. I was like, don't try to do the math. Like I can't figure out the debt to income ratio. Don't try to figure it out, right? Submit the application. The lender will figure out our debt to income ratio. I would say if, if it were you and I on the phone, I'm going to say, where are the scores? What are the student loans? Like we have a question that's asking about student loans. From the realtor's perspective, what I usually say about student loans is that we, what are they, right? Most of us have them. Um, we want to make sure that we're paying them on time. And then the lender is, so usually it's about a 1% of the total value that they use towards the debt to income ratio. What would you say, Andre? Well, with 1% is the worst case. Right. We, we, <laughs> have some, we have some tips, some, some tricks <laughs> that we use and some things we've been able to work out with like Navion and some of these other student loan places where we'll have you check into maybe getting a fully amortized payment, even if you're in a deferral, um, because using 1% a lot of times will kill somebody from being able to buy a house. There are some ways, again, again, because we deal with so many scenarios with people with student loans. I mean, we had a lady the other day, she had $184,000 in student loans. If we took 1%, that's $1,800 a month we would have to charge her. Well, we, we were able to work with her and the student loan company, and we only had to charge her a 200 some dollar a month payment versus $1,800. So whereas one lender had told her she, she couldn't buy a house, they told her she couldn't buy because they did the, the same math that Michelle did, where they take 1%. 1% of 184,000, that's a mortgage payment by itself. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, so I, again, this is why I, I just plead with everyone that, you know, this is where we, we take ourselves as being different. We're going to help you figure that out. You don't have to figure that out on your own. Some companies are just going to say, just like in her case, they told her she couldn't do it. Hmm. She couldn't do it. Love it. So really quickly, these are some good questions about student loans. I'm going to jump to those while we have them. Um, I have a student loan of 50000 I need to get on a payment plan for a loan or they're currently deferred? No, most all student loans right now are deferred. We're not telling people to get off their deferment. We just have to get a copy of your statement. Most of you probably have seen where student loans give you like four or five options. They give you a pay-as-you-go, income-based. There's like four or five different options. We will use one of those options to calculate to use for your mortgage. You don't have to start making mortgage. You don't have to start making payments on your student loan to be able to apply for a mortgage. Awesome. And Andrew, what I usually tell clients is, um, of course, wait, don't make any changes when it comes to your student loans. Don't call and ask for a payment plan. If they're already deferred, leave them deferred. If they're not, keep making the payment until you talk to the lender. And then the lender is going to tell us what to do in order to get the numbers right. Absolutely. Boom. Um, I have around 40,000 in student loans and still have a year and a half left in school. Congratulations on having a year and a half left of school. <laughs> yes, that is awesome, Heather. And 40,000, Andre, is that, the, is that a large number compared to what you've seen out there? <laughs> no, no, 40,000. <laughs> I just, I'm just, and, and, and the problem is, is I, I just tend to see them a lot higher, but no, 40,000 to me is not a lot. And again, just remember, we're not going to ask you to change anything, especially while you're still in school. You're probably, you're big, if you're in school, hopefully you're working full time. Your challenge could be if you're not working full time and you're in school is more the income part of that than the, the debt part of it. But no, we would not ask you to change it. 40,000 isn't a lot. Um, if we could qualify it using 1%, we would. But typically, there's a way for us to be able to, with us and you and the student loan place, to figure out a correct payment. Awesome. And so I know it's getting a little late, guys. So we're going to sh shoot through a couple more of these questions. And then we're going to talk about the home buying process in its entirety. And then we'll, we'll come up back to the questions. Um, NACA. Is NACA a good program to go through? 
I probably shouldn't answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> I am not a fan of NACA. Um, I, I just, so I may not be the best person to, to do that because I, one, I, I'm, not, I'm not a big fan of their process that they put people through. Um, I, I just don't think it's logically correct that you should have to go through all of that to be able to buy a home. Um, I, I know it has its place. I just think with the availability of down payment programs and other alternatives, um, I think there's easier and less complicated ways to do it than that. Good answer. Um, and what I'll say from the realtor's perspective is I think NACA is a great program for getting people prepared to buy homes, right? Um, when there, where the challenge comes is when it's actually time to purchase a home. Why? Because unfortunately, NACA is not very responsive. And so once you're under contract, that becomes a problem um, for, for a lot of sellers and for a lot of buyers. So what I always tell my clients is if you're in the program and it's working, I've seen clients improve their credit, improve their spending habits through the program. So it's a great financial um, education program. <coughs> when it comes time to buy the house, I definitely recommend working with some lenders that are not in the NACA program. I hope that helps. Um, do you get approved for a higher amount when it comes to conventional versus any other program? No. No, the no. What your your income and your debt is what drives that. The only way I could say maybe someone that may be true is depending on what part of the country you're looking in, the loan limits may be higher for conventional. There's parts, and I'll use Delaware as an example. There's parts of Delaware where there is a max max loan size for FHA which may not be the case for a conventional loan in that same state. So, but as far as the program itself preventing you from buying one or the other, no, there are some loan limits depending on which market you're looking at. Awesome, so I'm gonna combine this question, right? So we have, how do you calculate um, a married couple's credit? And then I have someone else who says, my partner and I have a 650 and 747, what program are we looking at? <laughs> Okay, all right, let's do the couple one first. The math, it doesn't change, just the middle score is good. So we're gonna, so if we have husband and a wife, we're gonna take the middle score of each and then whoever scores the lowest, that's the score we're gonna use. So it's always the middle. And if it's two people, we're gonna use the lowest score of those two. So to me, that, that was the easier question. The 650 and the 747, I'm going to tell you, it depends. You are credit wise, you're going to have, you can do either one of those two programs. We'll just figure out which one works better for you because a part of that depends on how much money do you have, how much money, what your debt to income, because you could have those same credit scores and your debt to income ratio may be 20% and you have money to put your down payment, then I would say, you know what, we should do a conventional loan. We have a scenario where your debt to income ratio is 55 and you don't have as much money or you have a lot of money, you wanna keep the money and I wanna put down the least as possible. Those are the conversations we, we have. So we're not gonna force you into one over the other. And that's why it's, it truly does depend. And, and the one piece I always like to say is, and I'll speak for Evolve, I, I won't speak for every other lender. We don't get paid any more or any less on which program you take. Yeah. We don't make any more money if you do conventional. We don't make any less money if you do FHA, vice versa. We get paid the same way across the board. So our job is to put you in what we think is the best program for you. Awesome. And my thoughts on that would be um, talk to a lender now, you know, credit wise, you're pretty, you're in a pretty good position. So talk to a lender to see if there's anything else you need to do to get ready. Um, you might have, a, you might have more options than you know. Awesome. Okay, guys. So what we're going to do really quickly is really quick. Actually, I'm going to drop um, the application for um, Andre in the chat. So just in case anyone wanted to check it out again, he is licensed in all 50 states. 
Um, and so what we're going to talk about, I think I did have one more. Do more people tend to buy in the summer? Um, I would like to buy by August due to kids in school. So generally the hottest market is what we call the spring market. And usually that's from February till right around August maybe right before August, right? Right before kids start going back to school. Um, people do buy a lot of the times in the summer in preparation for their kids going to school. Um, but needless, right now the market is just hot period. So people are out buying houses in general. So if you are looking to buy in August, it's time to get started right now. Cool. Cause it's gonna take us a little bit longer to find that <laughs> house. And so what I'm gonna do, so really quickly, let's talk about the home buying process, right? What does that look like? So I'll break it down. I usually say it's broken down into chunks, right? So the first chunk of that is the pre-approval, right? So it's getting ready to buy the house. Um, so generally that's income asset savings, right? And once we get to a place where we feel comfortable, then we submit the application, we get pre-approved. Why is a pre-approval letter important? Not just because people are kind of bougie and don't want to take you out to see a house. There's a couple of reasons. Sometimes in some states, it's required by law for you to have a pre-approval letter before you start looking at houses. Um, the other major reason is because in order to submit an offer, you have to be pre-approved. So let's say Michelle and Heather go looking at houses. We fall in love with the house. We want to submit an offer. In order to do that, that piece of paper has to be submitted with the offer. So it doesn't make sense to go out, fall in love with a house if we're pre-approved, especially when a pre-approval can take a couple of days. Speaking of, why does a pre-approval take a couple of days? Andre, can you please explain to us the difference between like just a quick pre-qual and a real, you know, going through direct underwriting and all that stuff? Yeah, let me, yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, the difference is, and, and I'll pick on some of these online lenders, a lot of them will just strictly make a decision based off your credit, just by you putting your information on the application. They really, so when you just say I've been pre qualified versus pre-approved, what we do is we actually request income docs, pay stubs. We're going to completely look at your file to make sure there's no surprises or no gotchas or, or that false sense of I'm really ready to go buy. That's, that's a big, big thing. It's no, a lot of lenders and especially a lot of the online, you can go on and fill in your information. And if your credit score meets a certain score and you answer the right questions, they will issue a prequel. Mm -hmm. They'll give you a prequel. I'm not a fan of that because when I, and I told you guys in the beginning, I used to not be, I haven't been in the mortgage business for 30 years. I've only been doing it about 12 to 15. When I first got in the business, everybody was doing just giving out letters like they were candy. And what happened is then later on in the process, you would go like you guys were asking, well, what about my student loans? You told me I was approved. I already gave notice in my place. I've already mentally moved into my, and then something comes up and you can't buy your house. Mm -hmm. I refuse to ever put someone through that. So our process, we do all of that up front. That's what makes us different than a lot of other companies. Um, you could absolutely get pre qualified and you're better realtors. And, and this is what's going to also help you win offers. When you turn it, when your lender, when your realtor turns in a letter and it says it's been pre qualified and you get a letter that says where you have income has been verified, assets have been verified, employment has been verified, that's what's going to make that seller feel more confident about accepting your offer versus the other offer. Uh, that's where I find there to be the big difference. Absolutely. So, and that's why I generally say that getting pre-approved is the biggest chunk of the home buying process, right? Because if you're working with a good lender, good lender, great lender, fabulous lender is going to make sure that all of our T's are crossed and I's are dotted before we go under contract, right? Because it's very rare, right? It does happen, but it's very rare that you should fall out of contract for financing. Like if anyone's paying attention to the market, you'll notice that a lot of these houses that were flying off the market and going under contract in like two to three days where they're coming back on the market. 
Why? Because of course life happens, things change, people lose jobs, but generally it's because they were either extra crazy offers over the appraised value or because the financing wasn't verified and super legit before get, getting the pre-fall. Cool? Yeah. Awesome. Um, I'm gonna come back to some of these questions real quick, guys. Veronica, Anisha, I see your question. Taylor, I see your question. So just really quick. So we've gotten through the pre, um, pre-approval pre chunk and now we are looking at houses, right? This is where the fun begins. We're pre-approved, we're looking at houses. Oh, my, my stuff's not fun, Michelle. Is that what you said? I just check it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, you know, <laughs> it's business, you know, we got to get it done. But, you know, the party starts the day we get that letter. I mean, I don't even call. He's like, he, one day he sends me a letter. He was like, Michelle, I've been trying to reach you for a week. You called real fast once I sent you <laughs> that letter <laughs> because it's a party, right? We worked really hard to get to that point. So now we're pre approved. And we're looking at houses, right? We get to see the beautiful kitchens, the amazing bathrooms. And so um, generally, again, before COVID, I would say if we're seriously looking, not just window shopping, it's gonna take us about two weeks to find a house. Now it, that time frame is a little longer and it may take one or two or more offers um, before we actually win, right? Just the name of the game right now. Um, but don't get discouraged. It's just all a part of the process. What are the key things I would say about looking for a house? Have realistic expectation right? So what does that mean? That does not mean that you can't have the most beautiful home in the world. It just means, especially as a first time home buyer, it's not, most likely it's not going to be the mini mansion that of our dreams, right? That, because a lot of times what happens with the first house is when we buy the second house, it's the equity in the first house that we use to put down a bigger down payment. Would you say that's accurate, Andre? Absolutely. Yeah. Awesome. So my job, your realtor's job is to make sure that you set realistic expectations and to try to find you the home of your dreams. What are the three variables that sometimes we have to think about? Budget, right? Usually the budget's pretty inflexible, right? We have a budget, the lender told us how much we can spend and we know how much we want to spend monthly and we try to stay below that. The second is location. You've heard it before, location, 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 right? Generally, the closer you are to the city, so in my area, in DC, the closer you are to DC, it's more expensive. If you're flexible with location, you can get bigger houses for the money, right? And then lastly is condition, age of the house, um, number of bedrooms, bigger backyard. Those are all things that we have to consider when looking for that dream house within our budget. Cool? We've looked at houses, we found the house, we've made a couple offers, now we're under contract. Yay, right? We're under contract, what happens? This starts the contract to close phase. Um, Jamila Jennings in the room, she is my transaction manager. What happens from contract to close, generally that is a 30 day window. What happens in that 30 days? Three major things. We have a home inspection. Home inspection is basically where we hire a home inspector to go in and make sure that there are no defects with the house. Not things we can see with our eyes, but foundation issues, roof issues, electrical issues, moisture issues, HVAC issues. Those are probably, I would say, the five big ones. Anything that we didn't know before we made the offer that was a surprise, usually that will give us the opportunity to go back and say, hey, Mr. Seller, the roof is toe up. Um, can you either replace the roof or give us a big credit so that way we, will, we can replace it? Mr. Seller says, yes, sure, here's some money. Yes, we'll replace it. Or no, we're not doing a thing. And then we can either accept that or walk away. That's home inspection. The second big thing that happens is the appraisal. Andre and team, they send out an appraiser to find out the value of the house. The house has to appraise for the value of the contract. If not, Again, bank is only gonna pay $300,000 on a house that's worth $300,000, right? Let's say the appraisal comes back low. The appraisal comes back high, we're excited. We've got equity, right? We've got some money in the house. We bought the house for 300, it appraises at 320, we just made 20 grand, right? House comes back, we buy the house for 300, appraisal comes back at 280. We now have to go back to Mr. Seller and say, um, Mr. Seller, you need to sell us this house for 280. Mr. Seller says, okay. Or Mr. Seller says, no, you have to pay the difference. And we either pay the difference, which we don't recommend, or we walk away. Cool. And then the 
third thing that happens is we're back with Andre and team. Well, actually this happens throughout the whole 30 days and it's called underwriting, right? And underwriting equals um, Andre and team coming back and asking for updated pay stubs, updated bank statements, and anything else that they need to fund the loan, to give us the money so that way we can buy our house. You wanna to talk to us a little bit about underwriting, Andre? <clears throat> yeah, the, the, my, <clears throat> my favorite analogy with underwriting is even though we did it and we collected everything up front, my, my example that I always use is when, when someone comes to you and asks you to borrow $100, you ask a bunch of questions for $100. <laughs> you should. <laughs> now, if they came and asked you for $1,000, you're going to ask a whole lot more questions than you did for 100000 so my analogy is when you're asking the bank to give you three hundred or four hundred thousand dollars, there's going to be some questions. Don't get frustrated. Don't get annoyed. <clears throat> it's just a matter that they have everything. The good part is because we collected everything up front, and, and I always go back to this is what makes certain lenders and certain partners better than others. We're going to anticipate those questions. So we're going to ask you for a lot of those things up front. So we always say we're doing that to make the process easier when it gets into underwriting. The underwriter's job is to verify <clears throat> all the documents we have given them. And then they're the ones that say, yep, okay, let's issue them the money to be able to buy the house. That's really the crux of what that is. It's not really asking for any of that. There are updated documents based off something that we received. As long as we do our job well, we should have already asked you for it. Where, 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 where hiccups come and problems come is something changed during the loan process. If the day we, the day we, we you know, you gave us everything, you were working at one company. And to, to Michelle's point, life happens, you lose your job, you switch jobs. That's a can of worms that we got to deal with. It's not something we can't deal with, but that's a big change from when the loan started. So it's really dealing with variances to whatever you gave us up front. My favorite analogy is <clears throat> treat your lender like an attorney. Mm. The client privilege. You, you tell us everything. There's no reason for you not to tell us that you owe money on taxes that we don't know about yet. Because my example is it will show up. It's going to come back. So <laughs> They're going to find it. <laughs> so definitely treat us like your attorney and give us full disclosure so we can figure out. Because one of the programs may allow you to owe taxes, whereas one program may not allow you to owe taxes. That's why it's important to have the conversation up front Again, that's why I feel like it's important to pick. You know, I saw a question, someone said, well, should I shop around with multiple different lenders? What I'm telling you is you really shouldn't be shopping for rates and this and that. What you really want to shop is to try to find someone that you click with. Yes, really someone that you're comfortable with. That's what's more important. I can tell you the best rates in the world, but if I don't care about you and I'm not looking out for your best interest, what does it matter? That's, that's the misnomer. So I, I would never tell someone not to check their options, but, but my only point is you got to feel comfortable and feel like who you're working with gives you information and they have your best interests at heart. Absolutely. And that's a great segue. So guys, once we're through underwriting and we get the clear to close, so usually about two to three days before um, close the closing date, we get something from the bank called clear to close. That's as amazing of a day as the pre-approval letter. And then we go to close, we sign a bunch of documents with the title company and we get the keys to the house. So um, we're gonna go back to some questions and really quickly, I want to um, go back to the question that Andre was ask, was answering. Someone asked, um, should right now, should we be shopping for lenders? Should we shop for realtors, right? Because they don't want a bunch of people running their credit. Yes, do not apply with a bunch of people. From my perspective, what I say, I agree with Andre 100%. It's all about relationship, right? And not like family and friends relationship, but 
a combination of a personal plus business relationship, right? Because again, to Andre's point, these are very transparent relationships, right? You're going to talk about money. You're going to talk about the good things with your money, the bad things with your money, with these people that you trust, right? So I say, always say relationship. And I say, as far as a lender, in my opinion only, it is better to work with a realtor who has a strong lending team. Why? Because they've closed deals together before, they've worked together before. Usually their teams are so intertwined that they just get things done together, right? And that's whether you work with us or whether you work with another team. Um, I never advise getting your financing first before you get your realtor because most good realtors will have preferred lenders. And preferred lenders will nine times out of 10 have access to all the down payment assistance programs. Cool. So just kind of like get your squad together. Awesome. Let's see what else. What if your credit isn't where it needs to be? Is there a time frame to get everything done? I, I, I guess that's for me. I'll answer that. <laughs> I, I, I would say to you, when you say your credit's not where it should be, my recommendation would be is, and whoever that question is, the link that Michelle sent you, I would tell you to go online, do the app, and let us tell you exactly where you're at because it's most of the time it's never as bad as someone mm -hmm. thinks. The other part of that is we'll tell you exactly what has to be done. One of the big things is people look at their credit and go, I got to pay off all this stuff. I got to do all of this. There's some of those items we're going to say that you don't, don't worry about. There's going to be some items we're going to say, if you pay that off, your score is going to get worse. These are things that you're not going to know just by looking at it. And depending on who you're getting advice from, and again, I like to beat up on credit repair companies, their job is to keep you under contract for as long as they can. Their job is not to get you a higher score in one day. Their job is to keep you as a client for as long as they can. Um, so that's, that's my advice on that piece. Awesome. And that kind of rolls right into Taylor's question, right? So she says, we are currently renting and our lease is up January 2022. Is there a time frame to get everything done? Yeah, I, again, I, I don't, especially with it being so, in January, seems like a long time from now. Mm -hmm. I still would say if you haven't been pre-qualified or pre-approved, you don't lose anything by getting that done now. Because it's going to tell you where you're at. It's, it's going to help you understand if there's things you have to do or if there's money you have to save up, you got plenty of time to get ready for that. I, I don't like telling someone to wait until two or three months before you're ready yeah. to, to apply because you just lost three or four. In this case, you would have lost five months for something you might would have been able to address. You know, we may have a conversation and I say, well, at your current situation, you can you can afford this or do that. And you may say, well, I really would like to be at this price range. or, And we could come up with a plan to help you get there over the course of that time. Whereas if you wait until right before you're ready to get done. And to Michelle's point earlier, I mean, we have some clients who have been out in the market looking for houses for months. Not that they don't want to buy. They just can't find their house yet. Yeah. So, so it's not a market right now where, even though they say the market is hot, everybody's out it's there really shopping. <laughs> <laughs> so again, it's, 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 that's that's my answer to that piece. Awesome. And and what I would say from the realtor's perspective is pre-COVID, um, I would probably have said three to six months, right? Because that process that I just talked about, pre getting pre-approved getting and finding the house, all of that, a nice amount of time would have been three months, right? So I always say three to six months. Now I'm going to say probably closer to six to nine months, right? So to Andre's point, if you're looking in January, now is definitely the time to start talking to the lender, even if, um, because usually how long does a pre-approval letter last, Andre? They're, they're really good for 60 days. Technically we can do 90. The only good part about it is all we're doing is getting updated, making sure nothing changed over really in that period of time. Um, yeah. it's, it's a pretty minor update to re-verify someone is still good. 
Absolutely. So I would say if you're looking at around, if you're looking in August, get started yesterday, right? Reach out to your realtor today. If you're looking in January, again, I would say this is the time where you would interview realtors. You would choose your realtor. Your, you would find out if you, um, you would talk to your realtor's preferred lender. You would see if you gel with preferred lender and team, and then um, you would go from there. Cool. Um, what do you suggest married couple where wife haven't changed her last name yet? Should she wait until after process? Ooh, does, it doesn't matter from a mortgage standpoint. It, it, it really doesn't because just understand we have people who buy houses that are not married, that are brothers, sisters, uncles, cousins, girlfriends, mm -hmm. boyfriends. So we would just, where, where it becomes an issue is if you've already changed your license or you're not changed your license, those are the things where we may need some proof that shows it. But if you're still using your maiden name, and that's still the name that's on your license, but your pay stubs are changed. You may, th this is where underwriting would say, can we get a copy of your marriage certificate to show that that's your married name? You just haven't done your legal name. Uh, that's the way that works. We would have you sign your documents based on whatever your legal name still is. Where it becomes a conflict is you get all excited and you sign the contract under your married name, <laughs> but you haven't legally changed your name. That's, that's where the problems tend to come up. But from a lending standpoint, there's no requirement that you change it to your married name. Absolutely. And then, you know, from my perspective, I'm saying just stay consistent, right? So if you're working with a realtor, let her know what your legal name is up front because you know, if, for example, if we met on Facebook, I might have you as your Facebook name <laughs> in my system, but your legal name on your ID may be a different last name. So just communicate that. So that way we can try to keep it consistent. There are ways around it. If, you know, we get halfway through and we find out oops, there's a change, there's addendums and paperwork that could be signed. It's not going to like kill the deal, but it just make life easier. So I would say um, if you're not under contract, and you are not buying till January or something, then go ahead and change your name, right? Because it's a process, it's a lot of paperwork. But if you know, you're know you trying to buy in the next three to six months, maybe just hold off until afterwards. Um, my credit is thawed for today, will be frozen tomorrow. Can I fill out the app today and you will receive all information needed or will I need to extend it? No, if, all right, I wanna make sure. <laughs> I want to make sure. Is it, gonna, is it gonna is only gonna be unfrozen for today at eight o'clock? And when does it lock again? Eight o'clock tomorrow night? Or send that for a little bit, just a little yeah. bit. Yeah, or at least give me at least PM. PM. Yeah, yeah. Unlock it tomorrow morning for me, and then you do the app tonight, and then we'll get it done in the morning. Yeah. And if they get in there and it's frozen, they'll just read back and reach back and say, Hey, unfreeze it so we can get in yeah. there. So you're welcome. All right, guys, do you have any other questions? Oh, let's see. How does it work with possibly buying a fixer upper? Can you get pre-approved, pay for the expenses to fix it? Ooh, good question. Yes, yes. There are, pro now, caveat, not for you to flip the house and sell it. <laughs> you can buy a fixer upper. Um, there are mortgages, FHA and conventional, both have renovation loans. Very popular right now in this market because there are a lot of the houses that are available need some TLC. So there are renovation loans that work exactly the same way. You can get those. So the answer is yes, you can buy a house and the way the process works with those is if it's under $35,000 worth of renovations, you can get any licensed contractor, you get a bid. It's, it's really not that what I consider difficult. If it's more than $35,000, you have to get a HUD consultant, which is technically your project manager for the project. Because the concept is you're dealing with a much bigger product. But I just want to be clear, these are renovation projects, not building a brand new home. Building a brand new house construction is a totally different product. Awesome. And we're going to segue there. But what I wanted to say really quickly about fixer uppers. So I know we do have a lot of first time home buyers in the room. Guys, just remember, this is going to be your first home purchase, right? Which means that 
all of a sudden there's no one to call when the dishwasher stops working. There's no one to call when the stove or the refrigerator stops working. There's no one to call when the plumbing starts leaking because those things will happen. It's inevitable. So my recommendation, especially for my first time home buyers, is to try to go as move in ready as possible because there's already going to be projects that you're that are going to be surprises because we've never owned before. That's um <laughs> kind of Heather. I'm saying generally <laughs> for your first time, we don't want to fix her up for, but I know some of us are HTV fans like myself and we really want to do it. So, you know, maybe a small project like a closet or, you know, some landscaping <laughs> or something, um, but nothing major. All right. Can you explain building homes when it comes to land? Ooh, so buying land flat out and building or new construction. Yeah, I, I can just tell you that is a much more complex purchase. It requires typically, I'm not going to say always, that it requires a pretty hefty down payment. Some programs require that you already own the land outright. Some of them require that you're going to put down 20% of it. Um, typically, it's a two-part project. <clears throat> the lender will buy the land and then they pay the builder in phases you're typically making mortgage payments while that's being done. And then once the whole project is complete, so there are multiple ways to do that. Um, again, my advice is if I would not recommend that to be your first type of transaction is to build that because it's technically, it's almost being building a custom home because you're, you, you really are. Um, that's different than buying a house that's new construction in a development or, but when you're truly talking about you going out and procuring the land, then finding a builder to build it, getting the permits. Um, I, I'm just sharing with you, it's a much more involved project. It's definitely a bigger financial commitment to do it. Absolutely. And as far as new construction, new construction is amazing, right? Um, what I'll say is that right now, the same way that it's tough to, um, find a pre-existing home, new construction, a lot of the builders have wait lists. And so if we're looking for a new construction home that already is gonna take six to nine months to build, then we wanna maybe add on another three months for that wait list. So we just wanna kind of keep that in mind. Um, and as I agree, like so a lot have clients that either own land or they wanna buy land. Buying a piece, so let's say there's a piece of land for in this area, right? Like $70,000. Nine times out of 10, we're not going to be able to just finance buying that $79,000 piece of land. We would have to probably buy that cash or do a construction wraparound loan, which includes the land plus the building of that project. So it can be a project, but if that's what you want to do, don't get discouraged. Call. Let's talk about it. And then our last question for the day is, is rent to own a bad way to go? <laughs> so I'm going to start with that one, right? So from my perspective, it's a twofold question. So I have clients that have um, gone through rent to own programs because they needed a place to live. And sometimes it's hard at that point in time, pre COVID, it was more difficult getting into a rental than it was to get into a rental own program. The truth is a lot of times it's easier to buy a house than it is to do either of those, <laughs> you know, honestly, um, especially rent. Like, I mean, to rent, sometimes people want you to have like a 680, 700 credit score. If you have that kind of credit and a good job, buy a house, period, right? Um, so what will I say about rent to own? With a rent to own program, you're gonna pay more money, right? You're gonna pay more fees to rent to own that place. Um, you're gonna pay um, just a lot more stuff and you don't own the home. It is a good way to kind of segue if you have to, but if you have the credit, and then so the other thing I would say is right now, a lot of the rent to own programs, just like the lenders, just like landlords, they have increased their credit requirements. So whereas pre-COVID, you can do a rent to own program with like a 550 credit score, as long as you had like the income and the deposit and the cash, some of these rent to own programs now have a 600 requirement. If you have a 600 credit score and you can rent to own, let's get ready to buy a house. My two cents. Andre, what would you say to them? Well, yeah, my my big piece with the rent to own is a lot of them have very specific clauses yeah. where you where you can lose your money, where you where that's that's to me is the biggest risk because typically they make you pay more than what's the rent, and a portion of that 
is to be used for you to buy the house. I, I've just seen a lot of situations where people have had to forfeit that money um, after going through all of that and they still didn't get to buy their house. So yeah. my big thing is just be super careful entering into a rent to own. Yeah. And there's some programs that are good. Like there's some actual individual investors out there um, that have properties that they'll lease to you for you to buy, right? They're just really good people and they believe in home ownership. Um, but get with your realtor to try to find those programs. And um, again, depending on the requirements, if the requirement is a 550, you found a house that you love and, you know, this is something that you can do, you're going to have to rent anyway, maybe it's a good idea depending on your situation if your score is a 620 and it's only going to take us another 20 points in six months to buy I'm always going to recommend let's do a little bit of work let's you know get ready get get in the game and let's buy a house all right guys if you have any other questions um you have Andre's information Andre really quickly what is your email address Andre.duncan uh, at getevolved.com See, I, I know that by heart, right? Yeah. <laughs> at getevolved.com. And you guys have all received emails from me, Michelle at DMV Luxury homes.com if you have any questions so my team's going to ping you right this is what i pay them for so you're going to get emails you're going to get texts you're going to get phone calls from my team if they harass you just be nice right <laughs> just be nice to them um and then you know if they're, if they're getting on your nerve just say hey i'm not interested or anything like that if you want to reach me directly guys that's my contact information i do answer my own emails so um we appreciate you being here if you got something out of this find me on google and give me like a review or something same thing with andre tell us you got a lot of good information and we weren't trying to sell you anything um just feed the people cool all right guys love you auntie <laughs> all right guys have a good night bye thanks andre thank you so much all right no problem have a great night all right talk to you tomorrow all right <laughs> <laughs>